The noon sun shines furiously in the blue sky as they finally hit the road. Though Hector dreads the heat of the sun and motor, he always thought something about the heat contrasted so well with the 65 mile an hour breeze. The tranquil mix of hot sun and cool wind usually cleared his head of all the negative energy that emanated from the monotony of life. However, this time, he couldn't stop thinking about the warning given by Mr. Scotty. No matter how hard he tried, something kept bringing Scotty's warning back to his mind, and rightly so. It took the same smell of burning rubber to jolt him back to the present moment. He needs to check the engine, but for fear that Matthew won't see him pull over, he opens the throttle, pulls next to Matthew, and signals for them to pull over. What's wrong, bub? Tired already? Matthew says, swinging his right leg back to dismount the bike. It's that burning smell of rubber I was telling you about. I don't want to blow the engine in the middle of nowhere. Hector sees Matthew's lower jaw protrude forward and his tongue attempt to rub the enamel off of his teeth, a distinct look of Matthew's when he is irritated. What in the hell are we going to do about it out here? These are old bikes. They're notorious for leaking oil and smelling funny. We're just giving her a good workout. That's all. It'll be fine. Matthew says. Okay, man. Hector says hesitantly. Matthew, seeing his hesitation, winks at him, smiles, and says, All right, man, let's bus it. Besides, we probably only got 30 miles or so to the next stop. They continue, and not even 10 miles further, he smells the burning rubber again. This time, accompanied by a loud bang, rapid knocks, grinding gears and no throttle, thus forcing him to the side of the road. To Hector's dismay, he sees his friend keep riding forward and past the curve. He decides to wait and see how long it takes Matthew to notice his riding companion is no longer with him. It takes exactly seven minutes until he hears the roar of the 54 Panhead echoing through the Mississippi hills. Matthew slows down to a crawl, turns and pulls up next to Hector, who looks irritated. Took you long enough, jackass, Hector said. Sorry about it, bub. What happened? I don't know. I think she blew a rod. She won't even turn over now. Should we call a tow truck? Matthew thinks about it for a few moments and says, Well, that's one option. Another option is for you to hop on the back of my bike and ride bitch to the next stop. If we did that, we could hide your bike in the woods and get in in the morning. Hector doesn't like the idea of leaving his bike out here all night and suggests to Matthew that they should just go ahead and call the towing company. Well, there is one more option. Matthew says with a playful smile. Not sure where Matthew is going, Hector says skeptically. Yeah, and what's that? We could camp out here tonight. Matthew can see Hector prepare to protest, and quickly says, Look, just hear me out. Even if we call the towing company now, it won't get here until late. And when we reach the next town, we have to wait until morning for a mechanic to even look at her. Which means we have to spend even more money on a hotel room. But... He says, raising his pointer finger as if to point out something overhead. If we sleep out here and call the towing company first thing in the morning, when we reach the next town, we won't have to wait for the shops to open, nor will we have to spend any more money on a hotel room. Hector, looking at the ground with his hands in his pockets, kicks some asphalt pebbles. He knows Matthew loves hiking and camping, and wants so bad to say yes. But... He can't stop thinking about the warnings given by Mr. Scotty at the last stop. The look in Scotty's eyes as he told the story of the Kanikos, a local legend, made Hector shudder. Hector's thoughts have been predicated with excerpts of that story. For whatever reason, he just can't stop thinking about the Kanikos. Mr. Scotty, a fine older gentleman, had introduced himself to the two when they were filling up at the last stop. He had inquired into where they were going and tried to prevent their venturing into this area. Ever since that old codger figured out what I've been up to, he has tried to prevent people's passage through here, suggesting instead a more northern route. I truly can't stand him and his disgusting piety. Luckily for me, this culture's antinomian mindset has really helped my work. Hector looks at Matthew and says, I don't know, man. Scotty made it pretty clear that this was a dangerous area. What? He was just spouting off old superstitious stories because we're tourists. None of that stuff is true. He seemed pretty convinced that those people were brutally murdered by the Kanikos. 
Hector, there's no such thing as the Canicos. That is just what the old timers say to people like us for gags. Whatever, man. Hector said, realizing that the old timer was probably just yanking their chain, and continued. You do realize this is how every B-rated horror story starts. Two guys alone in the woods? Yeah, well, that's also how every B-rated porno starts. So unless you intend on getting down and dirty, shut the hell up and let's sleep out here at night. Come on, man. It'll be like the strip down the Appalachian Trail. Hector thought for a moment, and against his better judgment decided that Matthew was probably right, saying, All right, man. But I'm Big Spoon. Hell yeah! Matthew exclaimed, throwing both fists into the air. Let's get the bikes off the road, and I'll start the fire. By the time they got the bikes off of the road, and found a suitable spot to light a fire, the sun had just ducked beyond the horizon, giving the woods an ominous glow. Hector, feeling uneasy from the forest, seeks to lighten the mood, saying, You call that a fire? Matthew replies, Oh, give me a break. None of this wood is good. Actually... Why don't you make yourself useful and find something that will actually burn? Hector instantly regrets his attempt to lighten the mood. He has no desire to go into the woods alone, for he can feel the acute malicious intent permeate from the darkness. He is instantly torn between his pride and Scotty's warnings. Visions of Matthew's irritation and Scotty's solemn face flood his mind. His shallow breaths tremble, but his eyes are stern. In fear and pride, he trudges into the gloom, ignorant. With the fire somewhat stable, Matthew looks for more wood to stoke the fire while he waits for Hector. He scans the woods, not seeing much in the moonlit night. The canopy, being thicker than it appeared from the road, did not let much light through. Seeing only shadows, he grips his knife a little tighter, recalling what Hector had said earlier. Damn it, Hector, he says under his breath. Now you got me all jumpy, you nerve-wracking son of a- Matthew jumps and drops his knife at the sudden scream of terror that erupts from behind the hill. HECTOR! Matthew screams as wild thoughts raced in his mind. Praying it was only Hector trying and failing to be funny, he sprints in the direction of the scream. And though he only has a few yards to run, time passes slowly, almost as if time stops. It seems to Matthew he is running for ages before he reaches his friend. Matthew sees the silhouette of his friend kneeling next to the log on the ground. Hector, are you alright? He says. The metallic humidity and smell of exposed bowels had not yet registered in his mind. Holy shit, man. Hector whispers. Are you alright? Yeah, I'm fine. I was just looking for some bigger pieces of wood and saw this. It scared the piss out of me, man. Yeah, I know. You screamed pretty damn loud. I thought an animal had attacked you or some shit. Is that a bobcat? Yeah, and look at this. Hector points to the animal's bowels. That is a massive cut. What do you think did this? I mean, it's a huge cut. Maybe a bear? I mean, obviously this animal wasn't hunted by a person. Unless they just get off on cutting animals up and leaving their bodies to rot. Ugh, that smell. What the hell is that? Matthew began to feel the fiery sting of the blisters forming on his hand from gripping the knife. Looking tentatively at the darkness that consumed the forest, he decided to ignore Hector's questions and get back to the fire. However, as he turns to the right, he sees another corpse. Hector, here's another. Jesus, is it nailed to a tree? Yeah, its insides have been completely removed, dissected. Come on, Matt. Let's get back to the fire. We can just use the wood we find there. As they walk cautiously back to the fire, they notice that they are in a minefield of murdered animals. At least, they assume murdered, because animals don't have that kind of artistry. Snakes, rabbits, coyotes, all disemboweled. A coyote is seen with its intestines removed and placed such that the animal is encircled by its own organs. And the contents of its lower organs have been removed and shoved in its mouth. Three snakes are seen. One has been turned inside out with its tail in its mouth. Another has been gutted with five sticks puncturing its body. And the third has been cut into 13 pieces. Matthew and Hector stare at each animal in shock, 
speechless at the art that has just been laid in front of them. As they get back, oh, this is most surely my favorite part. I am salivating in anticipation. As they get back to the fire, Matthew and Hector spend a long, tedious hour discussing what they had just seen and what the cause could have been. A hunter, another bobcat fighting for territory, a bear. Each proposed answer is a quite sufficient answer to the one who wants the subject dropped, but neither can drop it. When they look at each other, they know that not one of their hypotheses can quite explain what they had seen. I, of course, know the answer to this problem. You see, for though they are quite uncertain of the cause, there is something about the scene of the mutilated that speaks another language to their souls. This is because the scene is art. Art does that, because art betrays beauty. <laughs> art betrays beauty? Much like how the artwork of an artist betrays the artist's darkest tale. So too is this art both literally and figuratively betrayed beauty. Those mutilated animals were nothing. This was merely a drop of paint on a fresh canvas. Though every drop is important, some are more important than others. Hector and Matthew are to be the most important details of my work. I'm just happy that old man didn't scare them away. Luckily, this generation of people no longer heed the words of their old and experienced, preferring instead simply to shrug off their words as myths or superstition. If only they could see. Do you remember what that man was talking about back when we were filling up? Hector said. Oh, don't you go there, Hector. Look. But think about it. He was genuinely scared, and he tried to warn us not to stop on this stretch of road. There must be some kind of crazy man or animal out here. Hector keeps talking while Matthew recalls the mannerisms of the old man. But, of course, with the hysteria going around the fire, Matthew doesn't want to give in to the truth just yet. He wants to remain level-headed and not give in to the superstitious ideas. He is just so sure, as all humans are, that there is a reasonable, whatever the hell that means, explanation. Matthew just knows there had to be some reason for the corpses in the woods. No inductive or deductive reasoning was going to satiate his soul. It longs for the source of that art. It longs for me. Son of a bitch, Matthew. Are you even listening to me? Matthew? Hector sees Matthew's eyes fixed behind him, and Matthew's pale hue with the slight glow of the golden fire reflecting off of his face tells Hector everything. The old man at the gas station was right. A cold chill runs down his spine, stiffening his neck hair. I can see each one rise slowly. I can see Matthew wants to warn Hector, but he is gripped with such force at my sight that his heart moves into his throat and he chokes on his words. Instead, a slight raspy moan slips through his trembling lips. A layer of moisture is forming in his eyes from not blinking. Hector, the little devil, wants to turn around. Though before he does, he sees Matthew's back straight, and four plastic drops of blood fall from his left hand from the grip with which he is holding the knife. Matthew? He wheezes in a most pathetic voice. Matthew, what are you doing? His eye beams are affixed to mine, child, and they do threat to make one double string. Consumatum est. My child cries. We are one. We are many. It's going to be okay again. It is time for us to serve our master. He has called us to be his art. He is the brush. We are the paint, and the world is his canvas. Matthew, what's going on? I love the sound of fear in the voice of man. Oh, it truly resonates with my being. Matthew stands and towers above Hector, who in fear has collapsed to the ground. Don't be scared, Hector. He will make us beauty incarnate, for he is beauty itself. Matthew walks slowly over to the fallen Hector, leaves crunching under his heavy foot. With his right hand, he picks Hector off the ground by his neck and holds him just above eye level. Hector, struggling to breathe, kicks his feet furiously, only grazing the ground beneath him. There is no hesitation in the swift motions of his left hand as he repeatedly slices down Hector's abdomen again and again and again. Blood and bowel 
I'll strike the ground with a beautiful symphony of moist cacophony. The sounds reverberating through the forest, the grunts from Matthew, the stifled moans from Hector, the splattering of blood and bounds, are so orchestral that it would make Amadeus himself turn in his grave. So beautiful. Matthew finally stops, carefully throwing Hector's body to the side, and slowly bends to the ground. He tentatively moves the innards around, grabbing a fistful of mass from the colon, and pauses. After some moments, he looks at me and says, I have never been more proud of my art than at this moment. For my art to understand so perfectly, so purely, his position in my plan is single-handedly the most alluring moment I have ever experienced in my time bringing art back into this world. Matthew, I say to him, you have superseded my every expectation. You see, I am in a bit of a dilemma. The last Kandikos failed me terribly. You will replace him. In a most tasteful manner, he rubs the contents of Hector's colon on his forehead, chest, and both shoulders. Then he gazes deep into the zenith. After a few moments, Matthew says to me, I will be honored to be yours, Master. From my pocket, I pull the heart of the last Kanikos, rip it in half, and lay it on the ground before him, saying, Eat this, all of it, and you will have life for as long as you serve me well. Matthew screams as his body begins its transmutation. This is a truly beautiful process in which the disgusting human body is left behind as his soul takes on its new, perfected form. Deep wails gnash through the dense forest. <laughs> Consumatum est, I mumble, noting the irony. Come, child, let us go on a new adventure. I think it's time we pay that troublesome Scotty a visit. I'm tired of him interfering with my work. <laughs>